I want to introduce Brenda. Brenda Mann is very unique on the panel, and not only is she a mom and an advocate, but she is also a teacher, so she is going to have a really different perspective. She's had a child, two children with some disabilities, and she can talk about being in that unique position of being not only being an advocate, but being in a position where she's a mom, she's a teacher, and she knows it from all different views. Okay, so I already forgot something that I know as an advocate. So you can only imagine that teachers know things about children, but they forget. So they can have a child that's a certain way one year, but your child has ADHD like the child she had four years ago. Or your child has anxiety and shows symptoms like the child she had seven years ago. So they forgot that child who had anxiety two years ago, they're not gonna present the way your child this year does. And I did the same thing. So I brought my aromatherapy, because I always like to start out when I talk to parents, from, right, it's what happens in Vegas, what happens in Warrior Moms, right? So I brought this for you guys, Julie goes, you can't do that, people are gonna have allergies. Which I know, my kid has sensory issues. Which I know, I have undiagnosed sensory issues. My bra is getting crazy right now. Right? So you can't have this till later, but if you want a whip before you drive home back to reality, let me know when I've got cotton balls. So here's the what happens in Vegas, my ex-husband had a lot of mental health in his family. We only had anxiety in a far cousin with ADHD on his side. But knowing that, I knew that my kids had a great genetic reason to have some disorders. So when I was a teacher, I knew about ADHD, and I knew what happens if you have someone who isn't treated properly as a child, how psychologically that affects someone in their relationships, in their job, in their friendships, and very much in their marriage. So I became very involved with Chad, and I learned a lot about ADHD, and none of the teachers around me knew it. But I knew it because of my husband, ex-husband. And stupidly, the first time I sat down with a family and mentioned ADHD, and the dad was so excited because he said, Brenda, I've always hated school, and now all these things you're telling me, make, that's what he's doing, that's what I'm doing. And I left that conference feeling so fabulous. And the dad called me a week later and said, because we didn't email like we do now. This was a long time ago. He said, I'm going back to college. I hate my job. I hate my job. Now that we both have been, you know, my son's been tested. I asked the guy if he would test me because they already got him. They already figured it out. I was so thrilled. My principal comes down the hall like within a month because the dad went to the principal and told him how great I was. And Carl puts his arm around me, my principal, and he goes, I know you mean well, Brenda, but you can never tell anybody you think their kid has ADHD. And I looked at him and I'm like, are you kidding me? They didn't know what's going on. This kid has had issues since he was born. Like, why wouldn't I, as an educator, someone who sees that behavior and how it comes out in the classroom, mention it? If a child's eyes were watering, you would say to the parent, you know, they're watering a lot. Have you been to the allergist? There's something about brain disorders that we are not allowed to talk about in the schools. If your kid was itching all the time, right? Sneezing all the time? Who cares? Well, we're not allergies. If they're wheezing, you're not allowed. And teachers have been made very clear on this, that we are not doctors and we cannot diagnose. So, I put together a little thing because there's so much, and I don't know, how many of you have seen, I, I, you might have already saw this, the Welcome to Holland. Can you raise your hand if you've seen Welcome to Holland? Yes. I, okay, I said in my mind, if at least 30% of you have read it, I'm not going to do it again. Thank you. I want you all to read this again. Because when I read it before I came today, I started crying. Now, I've been sharing this with parents for a long time. But I have a child who there is no question he has autism. He has Asperger autism, but he's not. He's not the way they diagnose it. There's way too much going on with him that's like autism. He doesn't have friends, he's socially awkward, and it's his senior year. You have no idea how much my heart breaks every time people talk about the school end party and the, and the prom and the this and the that. So I want you to read Welcome to Holland and I want you to read it again and again because you have reason to cry. I never cry anymore about him. I cried right before coming into you because I'm going through the pain. So I want you to, first of all, this is why Julie wanted me to wear the t-shirt. I'm like, I'm not wearing the t-shirt. I am wearing what makes me happy. So I put this outfit on purposely. Usually I dress professionally. If you ever see me at school, I will not wear this. My best friend gave me this shirt because she knows I love 80s rock. 
I bought myself an antique bracelet for Mother's Day because I knew my kid's dad would never tell them to do anything. Right? <laughs> you've got to do what makes you happy and you've got to balance your life as a parent of a special child because you've got to be in balance. Raising these kids, raising neurotypical and physically healthy kids is a challenge. This is a whole other ballgame and that's what Welcome to Holland's all about. So I'm going to get off that and I'm going to go to the professional stuff now. All right, so I put it into three sections, and I'm going to tell you some stories that go with each section. If you didn't get this paper, I'm sorry. I thought the room would be like 30 people here, but there's like 60. So you can email me, and I'll send you a copy of this if you're visual and you need to have it written. I need to have things written. If you talk, if you talk to me, I don't hear you. Um, I want you to remember that teachers are not business people. They don't get paid more for working harder. They don't get paid more for having to work this with an IEP and they don't get paid more for being the best teacher at the school. And even the best teacher at the school who's a natural teacher, they cannot meet your child's needs. Period of the story. I don't care how great your advocate is, I don't care how great you are as a parent, they're truly, usually not able to meet everything. So you'll get your cookie cutter. How many people have IEPs? And how many people have 504s? 504 people listen very carefully to what I'm saying. IEPs are not followed in schools 100% of the time, even with the greatest teachers in the world. I have one elementary that I go to all the time. The teachers even refer me to their family members, and you know what? They forget what they should be doing for this child. And the mother, by the way, is the greatest person in the world. And when she hired me, she started off thinking she was friends with these people. And I told her about, <laughs> I told her about a very early client who I got way too late, one of my first clients. Child has bipolar, ADHD, autism, learning disability, speech and language, sensory issues, should I go on? And two parents who can't be consistent. They're very wealthy and they've paid every specialist in the world but they can't be consistent. So when she came to me, this kid was already a mess and I don't know how we were gonna clean it up. She thought buying the teacher's presents and giving gifts and bringing food to IEPs was really a good idea and she's right. Peter Wright, who I'm glad you mentioned, look up Wright's Law. Peter Wright, that's what he says when you go get trained by him. He says, ground knows your teachers because your kid needs you to do it. Your kid needs you to have your teacher know that you appreciate all that extra stuff that they do. Because you guys have, is anybody in here a teacher? Yes. <laughs> I will never go back again to the classroom, ever, because there's too much. And when you know what you know as an advocate or as a mom of kids with special needs, your guilt is heavy. Because I can't remember, like what Nicole was saying, you know, the little card. The teachers can't remember the card. They forget the card. They're packing up the room and three little boys are in the corner doing God knows what. And one little girl's crying and the other girl's mother for the 50th time is taking her out of class early and she didn't send a note. So your room is totally crazy. Okay? Teachers don't remember. So you better make sure to remember how much you appreciate what they do. So this client who came to me, her child without question should have been in the EI program. We have a great EI program in our district. She's in the district I'm in, West Bloomfield. The, the teachers and her were friends. They all wanted to make it work. No, they didn't want to send him away. He should have been sent away to the EI school. He needed it. He didn't get it, and now he's homeschooled. I don't know what this child would look like, so I help this mom figure out, and she'll call me and she'll say, because I do a lot of parent consulting and behavior coaching with parents, because listen, I got two kids and I'm divorced. Can you only imagine two kids with special needs in a divorce? Which, by the way, there is no communication between mom and dad. My kids have every reason in the world to be an absolute mess. But I know that behavior strategies are key as a parent and they're key as a teacher. So all of you out there, if you're blaming your teachers on things, look at your parenting. Make sure you're being consistent. Make sure if you have a reward system at home, you're doing it. Make sure if you have allowance, you're doing it weekly. Make sure if you have a punishment, you mean business, but your punishment is appropriate. See, you don't have the gift of a teacher saying to you, I see the kind of parent you are, and you're really flaky, and you're really disorganized, you're always saying things in front of your kid, and you need therapy, girl. You need therapy. But what I love is that if, as a parent consultant, I say that to my parents. I say, 
do you know how ADD you are? <laughs> and you want your kid to be organized? And you want the teacher to remember the card every week or whatever we're doing? I mean, come on. It's all about you as parents. That's why your balance is so critical. So you are not friends. You are in a professional relationship. Remember, not a business relationship. No one's making any more money because they work hard for your child. Right? right. Psychologists, social workers, teachers, and advocates are not lawyers. I haven't met a lawyer yet who doesn't bill me every time I call them because, you know, I've been through divorce. But the one thing I have learned is I'm never going to court without a lawyer. Because the one time I did, I got And my ex-husband brought his attorney. So what an advocate does for you is, I'm using inappropriate words, but I'm wearing my Def Leppard shirt. So I'm going to school and be screwed over and meet an advocate like that one mother that I met who was in my district. And I said, what? Like, but this is too many years past. What are we going to do now? Okay, they're not your friends. The second thing I want to talk about is teachers are not trained in special education. Yes, I knew ADD because I had a personal interest. I remember this mother came to me and she said, no, my, the mother didn't come. It was that same principal, Carl. He'd always put his arm around me like, I'm like, oh, God, what did I do now? He goes, Brenna, I've got someone for you. This is my third year teaching kindergarten. And by the way, I'm really a middle school person. It's a long story that I ended up teaching kindergarten, getting my ZA endorsement, and doing what I had to do, my master's in early childhood. I didn't want to do little kids, but I had to. That's what you have to do to work in that area. So am I on three minutes? Oh, God. So teachers don't know anything about special education. They know the words. You need to train them. You need to educate them. You need to bring them all the outside recommendations and highlight the ones you think are important. Do you know how many psychological evaluations I read that are so cookie cutter? And then I have certain psychologists who I love, and theirs are fabulous, and they're very specific to the child. So highlight what your specialist write. Star what, you know, show them what the, because it's not just you talking, it's now this, this doctorate of psychology or whoever's done the testing says do this. Make sure that you bring that. And I know you or your moms get on the internet and you read articles about your child because you could become the doctorate in their special needs. I became the doctorate in my kid's special needs. So in the beginning of the year, in the middle of the year, Right? Get the articles, highlight them, and start what means your child. Because the teacher doesn't know that that ADD doesn't look like this ADD. And that depression doesn't look like this depression. It comes out in different ways. The last thing I want to say is never assume anything. Ever. Ever assume that your teacher saw your kid's IEP. I had a client, the child could not share his desk. He had anxiety over stuff. They had a brand new teacher. The teacher missed the meeting with the resource room teacher and the social worker. You know, most schools have the special ed people. They, every school is different. The special ed person sit down with the general ed person and talk about a child's history and their needs and go through the IV. They forgot to do that. So the little boy hit the teacher when she let the little boy sit in his seat. They suspended the kid. Oh, no, 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 no. No. As an advocate, that's not allowed. You didn't follow the IEP. The IP is a federal document. There is law behind it. Bible fours are different, people. If you have them, you need to advocate harder. Because if you're in high school or middle school, you have a counselor usually in charge of your 504. They get all the kids in the school. If you have an IEP, you have a social worker and a special ed person, and that's all they do. So the 504 kids get lost a lot. So you gotta advocate harder. Now I'm not saying that your IP is being followed. Because when you have a good social worker, paying every day for them, they're your favorite person. They're not your best friend, they're your favorite person in the world. But then you have a bad social worker or a mediocre counselor. If you have that in your gut, you got to get in there and hyper advocate because you're not getting for your kids what they need if you have mediocre or not good. Most teachers are amazing. Most teachers care. I cared when I started teaching, but when that mother came to me about dyslexia, I'm like, I don't know anything about it. And I thought I was supposed to. I was a new teacher and I was so insecure. And I'm like, all the other teachers around me are better. And they should have put that kid in that class. And I didn't want to admit, I was 23 years old. I didn't want to admit that I didn't know. Educate your parents. Educate your teachers. Sorry, that's what I meant. Educate yourself. So what I want you to know is, the most important thing is, 
you need to talk to the principal the year before you start the next year and advocate for the right type of teacher. Not for Mrs. Robinson. Mrs. Robinson was good for Julie. She might not be good for your kid. Never ask for a certain teacher unless you've had them before. If you've had them before and your family has issues and you have a good relationship and the teacher is not sick of you already, most teachers love you if you're a fabulous advocating parent, you just move in and you start the year. There's no time to get introduced. Send thank you letters after every single meeting, not only to the teachers, like you said, to the parapros, to the lunch people, to everybody else. Those parapros are fabulous. They, are. they keep the teachers in order sometimes because the teachers are overwhelmed, especially now, filling out your IEP. The paperwork is ridiculous. Request a meeting at the beginning of the year and make sure that your teacher knows every accommodation, what worked, what didn't work. I had a parent, she had the best teacher last year who did all these fabulous things, not written in the section you talked about, Nicole. No, Nicole, right? We all just met. I'm so sorry I couldn't be here for the sleepover. I had to go with my kids. But make sure that stuff is written. Huh? Next year I'll be there. So the supplemental aids, that, that thing that that teacher had going that worked should have just smoothly been brought to the next year IEP, and it wasn't. So this new teacher who was so mediocre at best, she wanted to try, but she didn't know what to do. If it was in there, she would have known. And if she didn't have the meeting with someone because someone messed up, you would have had the meeting within the first two weeks and known that these special behavior plans were being put in place. Am I done, Julie? Julie's like, see Oh, I did, woo! Okay, so I want you to never assume. People say to me all the time when they hire me, well, why didn't they tell me? Well, first of all, I told you they can't tell you. Second of all, teachers are not doctors, so they don't know about it. And my special, these guys sound a lot more into the autism. I work with kids who have autism after school. I'm tired when I go home. God bless you all. I work with kids with the disorders that are really hidden. The ADD, the anxiety, the depression. A lot of kids with um, serious, oh, I'm losing the words. See, I told you I lose the words. No, executive when you function? No, executive function for me. You get in an accident and you have yeah, a brain Thank you, traumatic brain. I'm turning 50, so it's like my head is just not right. <laughs> so what I'm saying to you is they don't see your kid's disability. You have to share with them what it looks like at home. Just like Carla was saying, bring your family in. This is an emotional thing that they will never understand, ever. And the doctors who call me in to work with their families, you know who the doctors usually are? The ones who have special needs kids. Yeah. <laughs> They're the ones who call me first. The doctors think they know what's going on. They have no idea. So afterwards, if anybody needs a little aromatherapy, and we'll do it outside if someone has sensory <laughs> issues, oh my god, because I know you're going back to home.